Hello everybody and welcome to chapter 7 and in this chapter we're going to measure how we can gauge the overall size of an economy, its output, and what we call national income. So we're going to use a metric known as GDP or gross domestic product to assess an economy's performance and we'll look at the various ways it can be calculated both via expenditures and income. We're going to look at some other important national accounts that we sometimes publish the difference between nominal and real GDP, and finally, shortcomings of GDP. So anytime we try to measure an economy's overall performance, the term we utilize is known as national income accounting. And this in the United States is published by the Bureau of Economic Analysis, and they compile national income and product accounts. And why they do this is to assess the health of the economy, how strong it is, is it growing, is it contracting, help come up with policy and plot out the long run course of where we want the economy to go. So the biggest way we measure the size of an economy is known as gross domestic product or GDP. GDP is something that you may have seen and we were looking at it briefly in the previous chapter but what it means is it is a way to value the overall size of our economy or its output using dollars. The reason we use money, even though GDP is not a function of money like income, it's a function of production, is it makes comparisons easy. It's easy to compare the overall size of an economy to another if we use money to explain the economy. And it's easy to compare from one country to another. Otherwise, we would say this country made 10 million cars and 50 million computers. If we don't know what those things are worth and can assign a dollar value to it, we wouldn't really be able to determine what economy is larger or not. So generally we use, generally we use gross domestic product or GDP and we use dollars to denominate it. GDP is a value measure of finished products, so consumer products, final goods. We ignore intermediate goods, we ignore used goods. So for something to count towards GDP, we count any good and services final value. And the other important thing is GDP is a measure of domestic output only. And what we mean by that is only the goods and services made in the borders of the United States counts towards the United States GDP. It doesn't have to be made by American citizens, but all of the output that is done in our borders. For instance, BMW is a foreign company. However, they make cars in South Carolina. The cars they built it, build in South Carolina count towards the United States GDP. The cars they build in Germany do not. So that's what we mean by domestic output. So the reason we use dollars it's a way to compare different economies that make different things. So in this case, three sofas and two computers, or two sofas and three computers, what one is the more valuable economy? Well, we have to determine what sofas and computers are worth. So year two, the economy actually is more valuable or powerful because it made a mix of goods that were worth more. So we use dollars to denominate GDP, but we don't actually it's not something like income, it's not a salary. The dollars are just a way to determine can we compare one economy to another. So one way we can look at the approach to calculating GDP is known as the value added approach. And in the value added approach, once again, we can either look at two ways to incorporate a product. So we're looking at a coat. Highlighted here, $350, that's what the coat costs. That's its good price. That's what someone will pay, a consumer will pay, and that's its effect on GDP. So $350 is its impact on GDP, so we could just include it when it's a finished product and on the shelf in Macy's or Saks or wherever they sell it, and that's that. Or we could look at what is known as the value-added approach, where we start off with the sheep, then turning it into wool, then stitched into a coat, then into a wholesaler, and then finally to Macy's or Saks, who were ever selling it, and it's always going to match the same amount. Each part of the pipeline or each part of the production process adds a value onto the product where it eventually hits its final, uh, 
price. They're always going to match. Whether you look at all the value added steps or its final price, they're always going to be the same thing. Total sales values here, this is not part of GDP. That's just all of the things which happen to make this product. Its impact on GDP is only its final cost. So the value added approach is when it's wool sheared off the sheep, it was worth $120. Once it's processed into wool thread, $180, then stitched to $20, then sold to a wholesaler, $270, then sold to a retailer, $350, and that's its final price. GDP can never be a step of multiple counting. It's only the final value of a product once it is put on sale. So GDP also excludes some things. Any form of transfer payment is not part of GDP. So if you get social security or welfare or COVID relief money from the government, those are all public transfer payments, not part of GDP. It counts towards your own income, your own money, but that's already existing money. It is not a measure of production. Remember, GDP is not a measure of money, it is a measure of production, which we denominate with money. Any form of private transfer payment, your friend Venmo's you $100, that has nothing to do with GDP either. It's not a function of production. Stock market transactions have nothing to do with GDP. They're important. We're going to look at how they can impact things later on, but they have nothing to do with GDP. GDP is only the production of final goods. So purely financial transactions, like all three of those examples, are excluded from GDP. Secondhand sales, uh, used cars, you have an old car and you buy a new one and you sell your old car to your friend. That has nothing to do with GDP. Your 1999 Honda counted towards GDP in 1999 when it was brand new. If you resell it when it's an old cheap car to your friend, it's now no longer part of GDP. It's just a private transaction. So that has nothing to do with GDP as well because your used car counted towards GDP when it was manufactured. So anytime you sell anything secondhand, used products, they have nothing to do with GDP. So we can calculate GDP in two ways and think of it as two sides of the same coin or two routes that bring you to the same destination. Because by rule, regardless of if we use the income or expenditure approach, it will give you the same answer. The income approach is where we count income from each step of the production. So if we remember the coat, something like that, just on the scale of the entire economy, and we break it down into various categories, wages, rental income, interest income, and profits. The expenditures, excuse me, the expenditure approach, that's simply counting the sum of money spent buying final goods. So all of the final goods and services that we buy, if we sum total that, that's the expenditure approach and we break it down into who buys them. So regardless of what approach we use, we're gonna wind up with the same answer. So the expenditure approach is all household spending. So spending by me or you or indi private individuals, that's considered household spending. All business investment, all government spending, and finally all spending of foreigners in our borders. Remember GDP is the activity that goes on in our borders. That's your GDP. And that's an equation you may have seen before if you've taken an accounting class, we'll get to that. The income approach is all wages, all rents, all interest, all profits, plus statistical adjustments, adjusting for things like time, value of money, and all of that. They are always going to equal each other, and that is an extremely important point. Regardless of what approach you use, your answer is going to be equal, and that's something to keep in mind. So if we look at the U.S. economy in 2018 using the expenditures approach, the formula is C plus IG plus G plus XN. And we'll look at what all of these things are. If you've taken an accounting class, I can guarantee you've seen that formula before. So personal consumption is all the goods and services bought by private individuals in the economy. In 2018 in our country, that was around $14 trillion. Gross private domestic investment isn't money that businesses are investing in their futures, so plant product equipment, new factories, new buildings, all of that, about $3.7 trillion. Government purchases of things from technology products to vehicles to anything that the government can buy, about $3.5 trillion. And net exports for the United States is negative. Net exports, depending on the country you're looking at, can be positive or negative. What it means is that we export less than we import. 
And that makes sense. The United States and most Western countries import most of their goods and services. Whereas if we looked at the GDP of China, net exports would actually be a positive number. They export more than they import. If you import more than you export, it's actually going to reduce your GDP a bit, and that's what we're looking at here. So that's the expenditures approach. That's all the spending in our economy. And if we sum total it, about $20.658 trillion, or $20,658 in 2018, our GDP has since grown quite a bit from that point. But that's the 2018 numbers. If we use the income approach, the first thing that you want to look at right here, it's the same number. So all employee compensation goes first, then all rents, all interest, all proprietor's income, corporate profits, taxes on production and imports, we have to add them back in to calculate GDP. National income, therefore, is the sum total of all of that. Then we take out foreign factor income or income our companies have made in other countries. If Ford builds cars in Germany, the cars they build in Germany get subtracted from our GDP because it wasn't done in our borders. Uh, consumption of fixed capital or capital goods, we've covered those. Those are goods that we invest in the future. They get used up. Vehicles get used up. Equipment gets used up. However much of that gets used up gets added back. So we have to add that as well, consumption of fixed capital. And then that statistical adjuster. That's a calculated figure for things like anything like time value of money or any other adjustment. And you wind up with the exact same answer. So the biggest takeaway is regardless of whether you use all of the income or all of the spending, GDP is going to equal the exact same thing. So if we look at the consumption model or the one that you would see in accounting classes, uh, your biggest component is C, personal consumption. And that's all of the goods and services that individuals buy in an economy. And we break it down into what are called durable or non-durable goods. Durable goods, things like your car or your appliances at home, those are goods and services that are designed to last more than three years. Non-durable goods are pretty much everything else, everything we buy at stores and take for granted and all of that stuff are considered non-durable goods, less than a three-year life. So of all of the spending in the economy in the United States, generally around 10% on durables, about 30% on non-durables, and the other 60% on services. So we are considered a service-based economy as a consequence. So C is all goods, durable and non-durable, and all services bought. And that includes all domestic goods and all foreign goods produced in our borders. Once again, BMW building a car in South Carolina, that counts towards our GDP. The cars they build in Germany do not. Up next is what is called IG or gross private investment. And IG or gross private investment is... all of the plant machinery and equipment that businesses buy to invest in their future. So anytime they buy capital goods, anytime they embark on any kind of construction, anytime they invest in creating new works of art or music or any kind of industri and intellectual property, any kind of inventions, that all falls under gross investment. Changes in inventories. If a business is increasing its inventory that they have available, thinking that they're going to be growing in the future, that's considered an investment. If you stockpile inventory to increase your sales, that's a form of investment. If you run out your inventory because you think the economy is going to do bad, that's actually a negative form of investment. And what we lead to here, finally, another type of investment, creation of new capital assets, things that will help us grow in the future. Non-investment transactions are excluded. So businesses do all sorts of transactions. The only ones that count towards GDP are when they're doing things, investing in themselves to grow in the future. That counts towards GDP. So if we look at our expenditures approach here, a business has net investment or total investment before we take anything out. Then depreciation or those capital goods they're using up, they get subtracted. And consumption, government expenditures, and net exports, that's the rest of GDP. So for you to have a positive investment, 
depreciation has to be less than net investment. We need to be getting more capital goods than we're using up. And it's going to increase our supply of capital goods or stock of capital and grow our GDP. The other sides of the coin here, government purchases, that's anytime the government buys any form of goods or services. The military buying vehicles is an example. The FBI buying new computers is an example. And that's one of them. Anytime there's expenditures for publicly owned capital, publicly owned capital are things like schools and roads, government buildings. Anytime the government spends money on them, that counts as well. And it once again excludes transfer payments, social security payments and welfare and all of that. That's not part of GDP because it's money that already exists and it's just being transferred from one account to another. It's not a form of growth or pr production. And then finally, net exports, we add our exported goods and subtract our imported ones. If we sell more to the rest of the world than we import in, it's a positive number. If we import in more than we sell, it's a negative number. And depending on the country you're looking at, it's going to vary. If we looked at China, it's going to be a solidly positive number. If we look at the United States, it's going to be a solidly negative number. And in this case, here are selections of GDPs as of 2017. The US and China are still the largest economies in the world, but both of these have grown quite a bit since 2017. And this is just a selection of the overall size of various economies. And all of them are currently being measured in dollars. Most of the time we use one currency to compare all GDPs, otherwise it wouldn't be a fair comparison. And the US dollar is the one we primarily use to do so. Now, if we look at our income approach, that is the sum total of all of the income in our economy. So all of our employee compensation or salary, all collected rents, all earned interest, all proprietor's income, all corporate profits, and all taxes on production and imports. And then we would take out that foreign net factor income or income made by American businesses or companies outside of the United States. Once again, that gets taken out. The statistical adjuster, which is just a balancing amount, adjusting for things like time value of money and all kinds of stuff like that. And finally, um, whatever equipment is used or consumed over a given year, consumption of fixed capital, that is uh, added in as well. And we can find some other accounts as well, net domestic product, which is GDP less consumption of fixed capital. So if we want to see our GDP without those capital goods being used up, that's net domestic product. National income is net domestic product less the statistical discrepancy and plus the foreign factor income. So national income, basically all of the income made by our own companies, regardless of where it was made. All the income made by our nation, excuse me. Personal income is important. Personal income is all income paid to private citizens, regardless of whether it is earned or unearned. So Social Security would count towards personal income. That's just all of the money that has been earned by the people living in a country. And disposable income is the really big one. That's your personal income, less your personal taxes. Disposable income doesn't just mean all the money we can dispose of on frivolous nonsense. It literally means all of the money available to the people living in your economy to spend on goods and services, including food, rent, all of that, all of that stuff. So from necessities towards, towards regular purchases as well, that's your disposable income. So here's just an example of what the United States looked like in 2018, all of the various accounts with all of the things subtracted out and showing you GDP, NDP, national income, personal income, and disposable income. In 2018, disposable income was about $15.5 trillion, or that's the total amount of money that everybody living in this country had some totaled to spend on everything, ranging from staples and important things like food and shelter to things like cars and handbags and all of that. So just like we had a circular flow in previous chapters, it works for GDP as well. So. We can look at the income approach or the consumption approach. They're given in orange and green, and it shows you that regardless of what one you use, it will always equal the exact same thing. The income or consumption approach is identical. So this is a much more complicated circular flow, but even when we account for more transactions in the economy, 
income and expenditures are always going to be equal in a GDP sense. Now, one of the limitations of GDP is that it uses dollars. It has to use dollars because if it didn't, we wouldn't be able to gauge what economy was larger or smaller. But the problem with using dollars is money changes value over time. So since GDP is a dollar measure of production, if we're looking at different years, we have to adjust the dollars to a common amount. So nominal GDP is based on prices that prevailed when it was produced. But money generally becomes worth less over time. We generally have inflation. So our nominal GDP is not always going to be the same as what is known as our real GDP. And real GDP reflects these price changes. So if we ever want to compare, if we ever want to compare different years, we have to set them in the same dollars. So we can adjust them all to $2012 if we want to compare 2012 and 2022, or we can adjust them both to $2022, but we need to have them in a common money. Otherwise, our comparisons aren't going to be valid. So real GDP uses a base year price, whatever you choose to set it as, and then we can make valid comparisons. So if we want to create a real GDP, what we would do is get what is known as a price index. So we look at what's called a basket of goods, so uh, various goods and services in an economy. What do they cost now, and what do they cost in a year in the past, for instance? We divide by the specific year over the base year, and we get a price index. And it might be greater than one or less than one. And then our real GDP is simply our nominal GDP divided by our price index. So if we look Look here, in year one, our price index is equal to 100 because year one is the year we're setting everything to. Price of pizza was 10 bucks, price index 100 or one, 100% 100 or one. Nominal GDP is just simply output times price, 50 and adjusted 50. In year two, pizza's doubled in price. So our price index here is 200, 200%. Unadjusted nominal GDP is simply 7 times 20, or 140, so it looks like GDP went up tremendously. But if we adjust for our price index, we have to divide it by 200% or 2, it comes back down to 70. So GDP did climb, but it didn't climb anywhere near as much as it did before we adjusted it. So real GDP is very important because real GDP allows us to adjust for price changes. And you guys can work on the two blank ones and fill them in. But in each case, real GDP here is going to grow, but much less so than um, the changes really in the nominal ones. So to derive real GDP from nominal GDP, you would find nominal GDP for each year, compute a price index, and then divide each year's nominal GDP by the price index. That's method one. And that's what we generally do. Method two would be to break down nominal GDP into output and prices and find real GDP by determining the dollar amount that that output would have sold for if base year prices had prevailed. So you could do it that way as well. It's easier to do method one. That's generally the one we do and the one we just looked at. So if we look here, nominal GDP went up tremendously from 1995 to 2015. However, and all of this is in 2009 money. So they set the base year to 2009. So wherever you see the 100, that's the base year. Anything below 2009, the price index is under one or 100%. So it's actually causing real GDP to be larger than nominal. And anything above, it's over one or 100%. And it's causing real GDP to be less than nominal. In either case, our real GDP has gone up from 1995 to 2015, but much less so than our nominal GDP. So the biggest takeaway is if there is prices changing over time, if you have inflation, your real GDP is going to change much less than your nominal GDP.
is anything, excuse me, you're not being paid as part of the underground economy, as is anything that is flat out illegal, so um, anything like that. The biggest part of it, though, is once again, legal activities where they're not reporting it to the IRS. Anytime you get paid in cash or, or working off the books or anything like that, that's part of the underground economy. GDP also doesn't take into account environmental things. So even though we may be producing more, if we're really harming the environment, that's not counted in GDP. So that's something there. How the output is composed and distributed, that is not really taken into account either. And finally, any form of a non-economic, excuse me, non-economic source of well-being. So something that you get well-being from or satisfaction from that we can't measure economically, not part of GDP either. And this is just an example of various countries' underground economies as part of the GDP. So generally, the more corrupt the economy, the larger the underground economy. In the United States, it's a little under 10% we would consider the underground economy. So we actually have ways to estimate the underground economy, and we do that, but it's something that we cannot count in GDP. One other thing we can look at is known as gross output, and gross output, remember when we looked at our code example, that number over a thousand, all of the various steps. Gross output is all of the various steps instead of just the final value of the product. So gross output's the sum total of resource extraction, production, distribution, and what it costs at the end, its final output. It's obviously going to be much larger than GDP, and it's a way to really view the productive side of the economy. So in 2015, gross output in the United States was 31.5 trillion, but GDP was about 18 trillion. And gross output's useful, 2015, excuse me. Gross output's useful when attempting to gauge the magnitude of business <coughs> cycle fluctuations. During the 2007 to 2009 recession, real GDP fell by 4.2%, but gross output or our productivity, our various steps of production got hammered almost double that, more than double that, 8.6%. So total economic activity fell by more than twice as much as final output, which is explaining why employment fell so dramatically during and after the recession. So as a consequence, gross output is a useful statistic. Unlike GDP, it allows the product to be counted multiple times in all of its steps. And as we enter, well, we've long entered, but as we continue to go through the digital age, GDP becomes even harder to measure because like our cell phone example, it's very hard to account for quality improvements. A computer of today costs less in today's money than a computer in the 80s did in 1980s money. A computer in the 80s was about $3,000 in 1980s money. Uh, a top of the line laptop today is probably half that in today's money. And it's obviously millions of times faster. So we can't really account for that very well. Also, a lot of internet products that are extremely powerful for allowing us to be more productive are free. They make money in other ways by selling data and through advertising, but they don't cost anything to the consumer. So since the, having a Facebook account or a Snapchat or being on TikTok, it doesn't cost us anything to join, we can't really measure their overall impact on the economy in terms of GDP because there's no cost component. And GDP, remember, is valued with money. So since there's no cost component, it becomes very hard to measure how they affect GDP. Hedonic adjustment, that is once again what sort of pleasure or value do we get from improved products or services? We can't really take that into account. And finally, the dollar value on time. Your time is not free. And in economics, we consider it having a dollar value. So all of these new technologies, which we take for granted, which have saved us so much time and have allowed us to be so much more productive, we can't really take that into account in GDP either. So in the digital age, GDP is a lot harder to measure than it was before, and it's certainly got limitations. It's not a perfect metric. There is no such thing. And as a consequence, these are all of some of the shortcomings of GDP. That's going to take us to the end of chapter number seven pertaining to GDP or gross domestic product.